Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the year 2016, here in this modern worship space, we did a five-week study on the exciting Old Testament book of Lamentations. How many of you were here for that? A few sprinkles? Okay. So Reverend Josh Fitzpatrick was the pastor of modern worship at the time, and he and I thought, oh, great, there are five chapters in Lamentations, we'll do five weeks of Lamentations. Stephanie, of course, you're in youth ministry, you'll take one of the weeks, and Josh said he would take the other four. Well, life happens. Josh's wife gave birth to their second baby. And it was announced he was moving to California. So I ended up preaching three of the five weeks instead of my originally assigned one on the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is all about, you guessed it, lamenting. The Israelites are so caught up in how good their life used to be that they can't possibly see any hope for the future. It's a sad collection of pain and of suffering. And it isn't petty stuff that the people are upset about. The Israelites have been exiled. They have suffered devastating loss of life. They're hurting deeply. Needless to say, I was not thrilled to have to preach three weeks on such a painful book. And yet, as the weeks went on, I came to appreciate Lamentations. During those weeks, I was serving in youth ministry, and we lost one of our students in a tragic car accident. Lamenting became the water in which I was swimming. I learned from the book of Lamentations that it's holy to be upset, that it's holy to cry out and scream and to have deep moments of pain and anguish. I learned that Lamentations teaches us that in each of those moments, God shows up. Lamentations gives us all permission to grieve and to do so openly and passionately. This week, I found myself back in the book of Lamentations, rereading those three sermons I had given, reading all the articles I had saved, after the lives lost in Buffalo, and now the lives lost closer to home in Uvalde, I felt uncontrollable grief. And I read these words from Lamentations 5, 19 through 22. The Israelites cry, but you, Lord, will rule forever. Your throne lasts from one generation to the next. Why do you forget us continually? Why do you abandon us for such a long time? Return to us, Lord, to yourself. Please let us return. Give us new days like those long ago, unless you've completely rejected us or have become too angry with us. As I read their words, I sympathized with the Israelites. What have we done to deserve this, God? Why do these terrible things happen to the most innocent of people? I looked up and I cried out, Technically, our scripture reading for today isn't from Lamentations. It's from the book of Acts. You can see it right there on your bulletin. Technically, our theme for today isn't about suffering and pain. It's about ascension, like Meredith said. We're going on a different journey than I could have imagined. And still, it works. The beauty of the Bible is not that it is a collection of all of these different books over a huge span of time. The beauty of the Bible is that it is one continuous story 
that keeps pointing us forward to God. The laments of the Israelites are part of the fabric of Jesus and his disciples. It's what paves the way for what happens in the wake of Jesus' crucifixion. It's five centuries after the Israelites' laments from exile that we're introduced to the birth and life of Jesus Christ. During Jesus' life, the Jewish people are still considered under rule from another nation, but they're not in that same mindset that they were in Lamentations. The Jewish people are together, and they're practicing their faith together. During Advent, Christmas, Lent, and Easter, we focused on the Gospel of Luke. We looked at an overview of Jesus' life and then, of course, his death and resurrection. Today, we remember Jesus' ascension into heaven. Acts tells us that it happens 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. 40 days. Sometimes we like to rush through Jesus' ascension and we kind of lump it together with the resurrection. When in reality, Jesus stays on earth with the apostles for many days after. He doesn't just resurrect and peace out. Jesus stays. He teaches. He challenges. He eats meals with those closest to him. It's only 40 days later when he actually ascends. We're going to read just the end of the ascension. Acts 1, 9 through 11. After Jesus said these things, as they, the apostles, were watching, Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away, and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Jesus spends the 40 days teaching the apostles all about the kingdom of God, equipping them to continue to spread that good news across all of the world. Then he ascends. The apostles have already experienced Jesus' death. For three days, they mourned and suffered and hurt. They don't really seem to expect him to be resurrected. And yet he is. Then once Jesus is resurrected, he spends 40 days proving to them that he's the same Jesus they knew. But he's resurrected. Then he ascends. And the apostles are again left without Jesus. The apostles are experiencing a roller coaster of emotions here. Dead or not dead, here on earth or not. A German Renaissance artist by the name of Albrecht Dürer created a woodcutting of the Ascension. It is one of my favorite artworks of the Ascension because it doesn't focus on Jesus. Jesus is up at the top. Instead, the image stays with the apostles, the people who were left behind. And the apostles' faces aren't happy or excited. They're not impressed or in awe. The apostles look stunned. They look shocked. They look afraid and full of sorrow. And as they continue gazing up, Acts tells us that two men appear and say to them, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? I'm reminded of the two men in bright clothes from the resurrection story in Luke, who say to the women at the tomb, why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but he's been raised These men at the ascension say to the apostles, why are you standing here looking up? Suffering and grief have a way of freeze-framing our lives. 
when we encounter the bad in life, we are often stunned into inaction. Our mouths hang open. The tears can't stop forming. We are frozen. If you've ever experienced depression or anxiety, you know the feeling of being stuck and unable to see a way forward. After the tragedy in Uvalde, a lot of us were stuck. We were stunned. We were hurting. We were grieving. We want answers, and we want to know why something like this could happen to such innocent children. Some of us may have taken to social media to air our opinions. Others of us may have hit our knees in prayer. And even others of us may have crawled in bed beside our children and counted our blessings. And still I'd venture to say, most of us today are frozen. We're exhausted by the dialogue of politics and the what ifs and the that would never work and the what about our rights. We're paralyzed by these emotions. The apostles question how they could possibly go on without Jesus. They too are paralyzed by their emotions. Why are you just standing there? Do something. We are on earth for the short amount of time we have for a purpose. I do not believe that we are all just here waiting for heaven. We're here to do good, to share Christ's love, to be a community, to care for one another, to pray for each other. Did I mention to do good? To share the good news to the ends of the earth. We cannot spend our days gazing upward and ignoring the realities around us. Yes, we love Jesus and we want to live forever with God. And still, we have time left here on earth. We have work to do here. It's okay to be paralyzed with emotions. It is okay to grieve and to hurt, to suffer, to lament. But eventually, we must stop looking up and we must do something. The Israelites lamented hard and their story continued. The apostles are stunned that Jesus has left them for a second time. And their story continues. We can grieve for our world. And our stories still continue. We are moved to action because of the deepness of our emotions. Because of the rawness of our laments. If we're always looking up, we miss the world right around us. We overlook opportunities to speak up for change, to take notice of our neighbors and help give those who need it a voice. It is holy to grieve and it is holy to fight for a brighter world. There is a holiness in our hope for the future. Today, I mourn for the lives lost in Uvalde and in the number of mass shootings across America. Today, I grieve over the life of a dear church friend. Today, I hold the memories of deceased soldiers close to my heart. And still, I know that tomorrow will come. And I will need to step up and do my part to help our community and our world. We all heal on our own timelines. And if I'm being honest, some aches never fully heal. We should grieve 
and lament and cry out. And when you're ready for that next step, I ask you, why are you standing here looking up to heaven? Jesus is risen. He has ascended. You are the one still here on earth. It is you who has the power to work toward healing and reconciliation. May it be so. Amen.